Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro. It's the uh, third novel um, by this novelist, one of my favorites, uh, both the book and the writer. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize of Literature a few years ago, I want to say it was 2017, something like that, um, and continues to produce um, a pretty great book every uh, five years or so. Uh, this was the book that really um, brought him to uh, wider attention, and it's um, a very uh, compact, tidy, uh, well-structured little book. There's not a word or a punctuation mark out of place, and it is a it, it summarizes. Um, he he uses summarizes is the wrong word. He uses very heavily a couple of the themes and the style and the overall um, arc uh, that he would use in, in pretty much all his, uh, all his later fiction, with possibly one uh, major exception. Um, and so this is a book told uh, in first person as reminiscences um, by a man named Stevens. Um, he was a butler uh, for a important British uh, family uh, in the years uh, between uh, the wars and he's now you know getting near the end of his uh, career it's sometime in the 1950s you know some a good many years uh, after the war and the Lord who he had um, worked for and saw as kind of the uh, the um, <laughs> the North Star of his life has died and he's now working at the same estate for the the new owner um, and what Ishiguro does um, really masterfully well in this book in which he could go on to you know develop even further um, is sort of the the very precise control over the amount of information that the reader has about the story um, so by using um, Stephen's own voice, um, we get to know him because we get to know, you know, what he considers important to tell us and his manner of expressing himself and his um, sense of what, what's sensitive and what can simply be told directly, um, you know, which is, which is a very powerful way to tell the story by dropping them into, dropping the reader into the, uh, the first person mind. Um, and also Stephen's himself is uh, a character who is not at ease with his own history. Um, he's told himself, uh, and he tells us, you know, early in the book that um, he does care about serving humanity, that he does care about sort of broader ideals. He's not just a, um, a self-absorbed person. He does sort of want to leave uh, a mark and have his life mean something. And so he tells himself that he has done that, that he has served humanity by, I think the phrase is, by serving a great gentleman. That by helping his lord um, be a sort of great, noble, um, disinterested uh, person and a, and a sort of a, an example and a leader, um, that he has played some small role in the positive impact uh, that, that, that his Lord has had on the world. And the tale of the book is primarily Stevens revisiting his memories and letting himself realize two things. The first is that although the, the man he served, Lord, I want to say Darlington, but I'm worried I might just be mixing that up. But let's call him Lord Darlington, okay? If it isn't Lord Darlington, that's just because I couldn't be uh, bothered to, to check, because it's not that vital. Um, Lord Darlington was not the kind of like all-purpose um, 
positive influence on humanity and that things were are were you know considerably more complicated uh it's nothing so simple as like the guy was you know a hypocrite it's more that like through his um virtues he wound up contributing to some pretty awful stuff um it's that sense of the tragic where his because his lord was an unusually um caring and um disinterested person he actually wound up doing more damage than if he had been just a fairly ordinary venal human being. Stevens gradually lets himself sort of face this fact over the course of the book um, as little bits of his reminiscences um, which are very precise and very carefully tailored and so again we learn about him. He's a man who really really values precision um he will st <laughs> like start a sentence and then he'll stop because he he thinks he presented it badly and he'll rewrite it and, and then he'll finally arrive at some simple precise statement of affairs um he values he values accuracy he values precision he values the detachment that you need to cultivate if you're going to be like accurate and and precise um and so <laughs> what i you know, since we're living this through Stephen's memory and we have to trust um, his memory of events, uh, but we also notice from the way he presents events, but then later interprets them, that uh, things are, he is protecting himself from the implications of the events that he witnessed. He's putting them in their most neutral, least offensive light. He's trying to move past what becomes increasingly obvious is the dangerous, damaging course um, that that his lord has set on, and which he is, you know, aiding and abetting by by doing good service to his lord. Um, he he doesn't want to sort of like complete that simple equation. He wants to put it off, so he he makes efforts to not. Um, so he makes efforts to not notice. He notices enough that we, the reader, know what's going on, but then he rejects the implications of that. And that's a literary technique that I gotta say, Ishiguro has completely mastered. Um, he was already very good in this book, and by now he's gotten so much better at it, of giving the reader more information than the character in the book, um, letting the reader draw a tone and implications but not having the character confirm them yet, which maintains this air of enigma and uncertainty. So that even when the reader is pretty certain they know exactly what's going on, the real interest in the story derives from what will the char what will the character notice? Will they ever fully notice what they're involved in? What will it take to have them notice? And where will they go with that? Um, so that's that's like half of remains of the day is Stevens coming to this at least partial realization that his I have served humanity by serving a great gentleman is uh, is a, a, a deeply flawed <laughs> and incomplete version of the work of his life that it's a it's a it's a placeholder it's a it's a version of that he's been protecting um, because he, he doesn't want to deal with the consequences of, of looking underneath uh, the carpet and seeing what's really under there. Um, this is done well early in the book too, when he's you know he's now serving the new owner of the estate, and he lets some of the owner's guests think that he didn't actually serve the prior lord. Um, he lets them think that that he, you know, he's a more recent um, arrival, and he's called in by the, the new owner of the estate who's like, but you, you were, right? And he's like, yes, I'm, I was. Um, but we can see there, you know, that he already has some, even though he won't articulate it fully, he has some cause for knowing it's shameful to have known uh, the prior owner of the estate, the guy I remember as Lord Darlington, although I'm not sure that's correct. Um, he's aware of it. And he, he, when he has a chance to meet people, he, he downplays it and tries to like deny the connection without outright lying because he's, he's not a, a bad person um, in that 
way. Um, he's, you know, he's a normal person. He would like not to have to square that circle. Um, but over the course of the book, during which he takes a little bit of time off and he's writing these memoirs, he is able to confront it and um, feel some of the loss uh, that the damage that was that was done by by his lord, and also the lost uh, opportunity that he had that he can't tell himself now that he at least tried to, you know, uh, oppose this damage or to avert some of the consequences that he can't say to himself, I, you know, even if he was defeated at the end of your life, if you're defeated and, and things went badly, you could at least say, hell, I tried, right? But he can't even say that. He can't really, um, which, which is extremely painful to him. He would like to think that he's the kind of person who, who would have tried, even if he was, you know, sort of limited by his position and by his own personality, but, uh, he has to confront the fact that no, he, uh, he was not that person, and there were opportunities there, and he didn't pick them up. Um, that's half of the book, and that's part of what makes it, um, a great short novel, is that's only half of it. That would be ample <laughs> for many, uh, short novel. I mean, this thing's barely 200 pages. Uh, and, I mean, you can read it in an afternoon. Um, but that's only half the book. Um, matched to that is the awareness that in the course of seeking a sort of professional perfection, he sees this Lord's butler, There, you know, he's a very high-ranking um, person in this country estate, and he you know, it feels like it's an important part of his work to sort of set the tone and to, you know, hold to dignity. Um, and, you know, he's not completely wrong. Like, butlers, these country estates were important people, and they did have sometimes dozens, maybe more than a hundred people sort of looking up to them for, you know, how to behave. Um, I mean, I, I don't think it was quite like Downton Abbey or anything, but I don't think it was, I don't think it's a complete farce either. You know, he was a, he was like a household manager. But uh, in the course of doing that, that he sort of almost completely uh, lost touch with the chance to uh, build a, a, a more heartfelt, deeper, intimate life with those around him, primarily with his own father, um, who he, um, who he becomes ashamed of because he's, uh, he's not as, you know, sort of like professional and, uh, and, 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 um, dignified and distant and reticent, all these qualities that Stevens feels like he should have. Um, he, so there's this, you know, this self-imposed barrier between him and his father who, who wants to have a better relationship with him, um, and the housekeeper they hire, um, who is a, um, a passionate, by well, by you know, by by, by Stephen's standards, a, a passionate person who takes a real interest in him, and since she is roughly his peer and his co colleague, he can't just brush her off or ignore her. He has to come to some peace or to some sort of understanding with her interest in him, which they is implied is potentially romantic that she's drawn to him um, at one point in the book there's a really heartfelt scene where she finds him uh, reading and he puts the book away like he's ashamed and she sees this as a chance to sort of peek under his mask and and wants to see what it is and she basically has to rip the book out of his hand to see it and finds it's basically you know it's just like a, it's like a romance novel <laughs> there's absolutely nothing uh you know that anyone, any normal person, uh, would would feel like such a need to hide. Um, but Stevens is so committed to this image of himself as a man without sort of the lighter passions, who's just devoted to duty and reticence and efficiency and dignity, that even admitting that he has a taste for like light romance, you know, this is like the '30s, so this is going to be that kind of like, you know, fundamentally just optimistic and cheerful kind of 
soft tale of love kind of book that was so popular um, in you know now and ever honestly um, but uh, she confronts him with this and like what 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 why 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 do you have such a reaction about this and he's like well um, I'm not reading it because I respond to any of that I'm improving my command of English <laughs> I'm like it's part of the job I have to read this so that I will know you know how to how to use the English language better and just this patent excuse of to cover his deep fear and nervousness and anxiety around the idea of opening himself up uh, to someone else and to sharing um, his thoughts and feelings with another person and being really like honest and vulnerable. Um, it's deeply affecting. Um, it really, you feel for him like you might to a child. I mean, the character is in his. I presume late 50s, early 60s, when he's telling this tale, and he's looking back on most of his life, and he's seeing that he both missed his chance to um, take some sort of ethical stance that would have fit his wider ideals, that he, you know, maybe devoted himself too fully to a, to a lord who proved to be a, a flawed uh, champion, and neglected his ability to take an independent stance uh, on these issues. But that right there, you know, is already pretty heartbreaking. But then also see that he lost the chance for uh, a deeper inner life, one that had more to it than than duty. Hey, you know, you know, love. He lost love. He never had children. He lost the chance for like deeper friendships. Um, all in, in the service of a uh, a kind of ideal of personality and behavior that ultimately he can't live up to because the end of the book after he faces both of these revelations about his life he's on a pier at like a, a coastal amusement pier um, and he shares this feeling with a stranger this feeling that he's <laughs> wasted his life, um, which because of Ishiguro's, you know, artful, um, receding presentation of, 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 of details, by now we really fully share in his, in Stephen's despair, um, and so when this stranger listening to him offers a few bromides along the lines of like, listen man, the past is past, <laughs> you gotta look to the future. You know, the end of the day is the best part. You know, you've got you've got things to do. You've got you've got life to live. Don't don't be morbid. Don't don't constantly be looking back. And it is a bit of a relief when Stevens recognizes this as some sort of lifeline, and he takes it. Um, he does you know take it as a, a meaningful statement and a good attitude to have. And he's going to go back and you know bring the house back to do a good job at at his work which he still has and he's going to you know restore the um the grandeur of the house he's been complaining about it being in disrepair and not getting enough s servants and things like this and so his you still have some time <laughs> this that he gets from this stranger this attitude you still have some time it's not done there are other things that will come along makes it a fundamentally um upbeat <laughs> book uh, in a way that others of Ishiguro's books are not, <laughs> because Stephen's flaw is that when he should have done something, he did nothing. Um, he did t t too little, um, turned down chances, and never practiced um, spotting opportunities and taking them because of you know the limits of his self-imposed role and his his, his diffident uh, personality. But in others of Ishiguro's books. Um, we face people who did take opportunities and did do things and face a whole different level of of problems um, when they are when they are looking back uh, on their fates. Looking back on their fates uh, is a common theme, um, and it reminds me. Ishiguro, I believe, was born in Japan, but English is his is his native language. And um, 
but it remind it's very reminiscent of the uh, post-war uh, Japanese dramas uh, that were coming around when Ishiguro was born, which I think was 1954, like Ikiru, uh, Kurosawa's great movie about a man who's told that he has only a year to live and also goes through a similar, um, what have I done? <laughs> what, what have I missed? What can I still do? Uh, very similar to Stevens and Remains of the Day. Um, it has a touch of the Ivan Illich, you know, that when a normal person suddenly has to look up and out and think about their life in a way that they haven't up to this point. Um, what do they do? What does that feel like? It's not too hard to write about that, but what Ishiguro's fiction does is it really makes you feel the experience of it, um, which is such a trick. <laughs> it's such it's so difficult, and I really appreciate the um, the time that he took. Um, to develop it. I feel like The Remains of the Day was actually his third novel, um, but it was the one where he began to show a great deal of the promise, which has then been later paid off by some of his later books, which are among the best novels um, that you'll, you'll ever care to read. And Remains of the Day is a wonderful place to start so that you get to know the kind of structure and the way to read his novels so that when you get to the later, more ambitious ones, um, you can sort of appreciate, you can both appreciate the artistry and simply experience it, which is something that I look for in any creative work is can I, can I notice it, but can I also forget about it and simply experience it? Because getting to choose whether you will do one or the other, when the work is too ham-fisted, you can't help but notice the artistry because it's failing you. And when it's only about um, feeling the experience of it. I feel like you lose something of the appreciation for the artificiality of the whole enterprise of a work of art. Um, so when you can move back and forth between those points uh, with a, a really well-created piece, uh, the experience is hugely satisfying and it allows for multiple re-readings or re-viewings or re-experiences looking for new connections between the craft and the experience and this book uh, has strong pieces of both uh, going for it that would only get better uh, in his later works. Uh, it was also made into a pretty darn good movie uh, for those interested in that kind of thing that I'm sure helped um, Ishiguro get some of his more uh, experimental works off the ground but um, yeah I think it was a Merchant Ivory movie. Anyone who watched British movies in the 80s, 90s, and aughts will remember those. They were like relatively uh, uncomplicated movies based on works of fiction, but with beautiful costumes and some very good actors uh, usually playing out something from Britain's past. And in this case, it's uh, Anthony Hopkins playing Stevens, which is wonderful casting, and Emma Thompson playing the housekeeper. Their scenes just really, really sing. Uh, so do check this book out. It's um, in the Everman's Library now, which is sort of giving a stamp of approval from the literary establishment, and um, it won the Booker Prize as well in its day, which is, uh, you know, it had its ups and downs, but in general is a, a literary prize you can usually trust when it's on a work of fiction. Okay, more next time.